मूकं करोति वाचालं पंगुं लंगयते गिरिं यत्कृपा तमहं वंदे परमानंदमाधवं ओके आई हैव अ वेरी डिफिकल्ट टास्क इन फ्रंट ऑफ मी आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक टू यू अबाउट द कनेक्शंस बिटवीन साइंस एंड स्पिरिचुअलिटी व्हेन आई से दैट देयर इज दैट इज टू वास्ट a topic specifically i'm going to talk to you about the connections between modern physics and what is known as sanatana dharma and the ancient wisdom of our country so in this process i will ask you questions it's a bit technical but then i crave your attention this is a this is a kind of talk you give to a class of 60 people not to a crowd of 1200 however i'm going to try my best and you will need to be really silent because i'm going to be telling you certain startling things i'm going to start by saying so i need them to i need all of you on the side to sit down and yeah if all of you can sit down yeah so what i'm going to be telling you is certain strange ideas which will seem completely against your common sense notion of this world and of reality and of who you think you are but at the same time there is nothing that i am going to tell you i repeat listen to this carefully there is nothing that i am going to tell you which is not corroborated by a nobel laureate all the things i am telling you today which over the next half an hour are latest nobel prize winning discoveries even last year things that were published in journals like nature nature is one of the world's most advanced scientific journals how many of you published in nature i don't think so if you generally those who publish in nature go on to get the nobel prize okay how many of you got the nobel prize nobody yeah i haven't yet received mine okay but that's that's okay well so i don't think i will either that's okay so but anyway so please uh, please bear with me whatever i am going to tell you is going to be okay whatever i am going to tell you is corroborated by nobel prize winning scientists okay that's the first step second step whatever i am going to tell you is going to confuse you if after this talk two things will happen either you will fall asleep because you are really hungry and you want to go for lunch and this man is talking about quantum mechanics or you will be thoroughly confused if you are not confused at the end of the talk then you haven't understood it actually i am going to talk to you about the relationship between quantum mechanics and consciousness that sounds like a pretty tacky topic what's quantum mechanics and consciousness wow but you see it's a very difficult task but at the same time it's very easy because i'm supremely confident i don't know it's easy to talk about quantum mechanics and consciousness for me because i don't know much about either i don't know much about quantum mechanics nor do i know much about consciousness but i am supremely confident that none of you do either because, because nobody in the world completely knows that's why i'm not blaming you so let's start it all started it all started with the atom bomb okay the where modern physics is starting to look like ancient indian spirituality started around 1910 1905 okay about 100 years ago and it started around the time of the atom bomb also have you heard of this equation e equals mc squared excellent who came up with the equation e equal to mc squared thank you what is e what is m mass of what okay what is c perfect now that you know e equals mc squared you guys should know everything else if you understand e is equal to mc squared there's nothing left to understand but the chances are that we don't know see most of us we learn things without knowing there was a scientist so you all heard of einstein have you heard of niels bohr 
very good have you heard of erwin schrodinger yes. wow have you heard of pauli yes. pauli's exclusion principle yes. give yourself a round of applause okay have you heard okay now i am going to make the question slightly tougher have you heard of dirac yes who has heard of dirac what have you heard about dirac dirac delta function okay you heard of dirac okay these are the quantum physicists and have you heard of perhaps the greatest of them all one of the greatest have you heard of richard feynman i am impressed have you read the book surely you are joking mr feynman no feynman was an incredible scientist okay can you all hear me at the back at the back at the very back yeah richard feynman was an incredible scientist he of course got the nobel prize in quantum electrodynamics and he came up with the most fundamental questions that are still unanswered today which i'm going to show you and which somehow relates to you and that's the mystery it relates to you and it relates to this summit so what happened richard feynman was a great scientist and he uh, his he was working on these electron orbits and all that stuff his first wife died due to cancer he got depressed and he was about to drop out of physics at that time one day he was sitting in a restaurant i think in new york when he saw the waiter playing with the saucer okay the saucer you know a saucer playing with the saucer the saucer went up and came down right but it just didn't go up and come down it wobbles you understand it goes up like a top you understand what is wobbling it goes like that and comes down it doesn't just rotate the axis of rotation rotates you understand it wobbles the saucer wobbled up and down and as he was watching something like you know if you have seen these people make this rumali roti have you seen they throw this rumali roti up in the air and it circulates and gyrates and comes down exactly like that so when he was seeing these this saucer wobbling up and down he suddenly realized that this is what similar to what electron orbits do under certain conditions and he came up with this theory and he went on to get the nobel prize in quantum electrodynamics see so next time you go to a hotel and see something funny watch out you may get the nobel prize okay okay now that's a joke and unless you laugh for my jokes i'll assume you're asleep so thank you so, so that's that was the genius that richard feynman was but you know there was one thing about richard feynman he used to question each and everything and unfortunately our present education including science i have a phd in science that's why i'm telling you including science does not necessarily answer all the questions i'm going to ask you a question you see i'm going to show you a small experiment this is an empty beaker i'm going to place it here in front of me and i'm going to do something i am going to what i am going to do is just like when you are going in a car or going in a bus the drive and you are sitting in the back seat and you don't have a seat belt on and the driver suddenly applies the brake what happens to you you fall forward right so so i am going to show i am going to pull this beaker in this direction and the lid will fall in the other direction okay let's see if it works okay here hold on bated breath 5 4 Count down, please. Okay, there it is. So I took the beaker here, I pushed it in this direction, and the lid fell in the opposite direction. All of you have seen this before. The question to you is why? Yeah, why? 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 Inertia. Exactly. All of you answered inertia. All of you are wrong. I'll tell you why. what happened is i'll take a question later <laughs> fine man when he was a kid his dad was also very intelligent he was not a his dad was not a physicist but very intelligent so when he was a kid he had a cart and there was a ball on the cart and fine man when he pulled the cart in one direction richard richard fine man right richard pulled the cart in one direction the ball went in the opposite direction so fine man wanted to know why he asked daddy when i pull the cart in one direction the ball goes in the opposite direction just like this when i pull the beaker in one direction the lid fell in the opposite direction daddy why does this happen he asks his dad his dad was not a physicist but his dad was very intelligent 
So the question is, why does it happen? And listen to, the to, to listen to his dad's answer. His dad answered, nobody knows why, but people call it inertia. You see the difference? I asked you, why does it do happen? You all said inertia. I didn't ask you what you call it. I don't care what you call it. You can call it inertia, you can call it X, Y, Igli Pugli Poo, I don't care. I asked you why you said inertia. That's not an answer, that is what you are terming it. Just because you term something doesn't mean you know it. Nobody knows why, that's the way it is. An object continues in its place of motion unless acted upon by an external force. That's the way this world is made. Nobody knows why. But you see, you all, including your teachers, all due respect to all teachers, my teacher, myself, all of us made the mistake of thinking we understand something because we name it. Even in science, this hoodwinking happens. So I am going to tell you something, startling things today, which I will show you why your pre our present understanding of this world is completely wrong. Completely wrong. For example, you assume you're sitting on that chair and you know where it is. You're wrong. I'll show you. So you see, that is, that is what I mean when I say. So you know what, Feynman, you all know that, you all know that an atom is made of electrons and nucleus has protons and neutrons and electrons going around nucleus. Yes, yes or no? Yes or no? Yeah. Have any of you seen an electron? Any of you uh, caught, caught it in your hand? Any of you gone to chai with an electron? No. Okay. Have you conducted the Millikan drop experiment? Do you study? Have you done the E by M ratio? No. Feynman, you know what Feynman, the Nobel laureate, says about the electron? He says, the electron is a very good theory. That's what Feynman, the Nobel laureate in physics, says about the electron. He says, the electron is a very good theory. There is a particle. Behaves in a negative manner, negative charge. It has a specific E by M ratio. You do this experiment, it turns out that. So we assume that there is a particle that obeys these characteristics. Could there be a system of particles that access one and does this? Could be. Could there be some other fluctuation that is causing this? Could be. Then why do you say it's an electron? It's an assumption. Most of what we think are assumptions. Anyway, this is fine. By the way, I didn't say that electron is a good theory. Fine men say electron is a good theory. Feynman is a Nobel Prize winning physicist. So anyway, so now, so you know that an atom, you have electrons spinning around the nucleus of the atom, okay? Now, suppose you take a hydrogen atom, I have a nucleus and I have one electron spinning around it. Compared to the electron, the nucleus is huge. Yes or no? Yes or no? I don't hear an enthusiastic yes. yes. Yeah. And the gap between the nucleus and the electron is even more. So supposing I have an atom, hydrogen atom, and I expand the nucleus to the size of a small marble, okay? To go to the first electron in that scale, I'll have to go near Cochin in that scale. That is the size. You understand what I'm saying? The gap between the first electron orbit and the nucleus is so huge that if I expand the nucleus to a size of a marble on that scale, to mark where the first electron orbit is, I will have to go maybe to Kayangulam or the next town to mark it on that scale. What it means is that an atom, compared to the electron, an atom is mostly, what? Yes, what? Empty space. An atom is mostly empty space. Okay. Okay. An atom is mostly empty space. Very good then. So this hand is mostly, hand is made of atoms. So my hand is mostly empty space. Yes or no? Yes. Very good. This hand is mostly empty space. Yes or no? My head is mostly empty space. Your head too. So this hand is mostly empty space. This hand is mostly empty space. Then what is this? Where is this sound coming from? Where is this repulsion coming from? Look at this. This table is... Oops. Let me not break anything. This... Take the surface is mostly empty space. If you take an electron microscope and look at the surface, you won't see a surface at all. You will see different disparate atoms. 
The surface is mostly empty space. My hand is mostly empty space. Ouch! Then what is it that I feel? I am feeling a surface. Why doesn't it just go through? If this is mostly empty space and that is mostly empty space, why don't my hands just pass through each other? What is it that I feel? This floor is mostly empty space. My foot is mostly empty space. What do I feel? What is the surface that I feel? Can you tell me? I'll tell you what you're feeling. You are feeling Pauli's exclusion principle. You are feeling the fact that you can't put two electrons in the same place at the same time. You're feeling electrostatic repulsion, negative, negative repulsion, right? 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0 q1 q2 over r squared, you study. You, you're feeling a repulsive force all over the place which your mind interprets as a surface, okay? You are feeling a repulsive force which your mind interprets as, as, as a surface. In reality, there is no surface. So, where is the surface? Where is the surface? Where is the surface that you feel? Let me ask you a question. Supposing this was not made of wood. Let's assume this is made of steel. Will I have the same feeling? Will I get the same feeling? No. If it's made of rubber, will I get the same feeling? No. If it's, if it's made of a gooey, gooey, Snickers, chocolate, will I get the same feeling? No. So, where is this surface that I'm feeling really? Where is the perception happening? Mind. The perception is happening in the mind. What you are experiencing in this world, what you assume is real, is not necessarily true. What you are experiencing is a perception through your mind. That's what you are experiencing. What you're, the, the surface you are sitting on, this entire, that's true for this floor, that's true for the surface, that's true for the chair, that's true for this whole thing. Let's assume, for example, you're all looking at me, right? You're all looking at me. And you're using visible light to see me, okay? That's why you see this charming, handsome figure, okay? In front of you. Okay. Now, supposing you used x-rays to see me, what will I look like? Skeleton, exactly. You will be running away. Yeah. Supposing you use infrared rays to see me, what will I look like? I'll be patches of white and black. If you use UV, ultraviolet light to see me, what will I look like? Please don't try, I'll die, okay? Uh, if I use gamma rays to see me, what will I look like? Again, I will die. So you see, now tell me, if you use visible light, I look like this. If you use x-rays, I look like a skeleton. If you use some other infrared rays, I look different. So what is my real form? What is my real form? Tell me, what is my real form? Is there some such thing? Is there some such thing as real form? Yes or no? No, there is no such thing as a real form. Where does this form exist? It depends upon your observation, yes or no? So, first point you need to understand. This universe is simultaneously happening in two places. One, outside you and two, inside you. You are programmed by your mind and by your perceptions. Yeah. You are all clapping for that, but it's not a, so easy to understand. It is not easy to understand. Simultaneously, your reality is being programmed to you by your own mind. What is real, you don't know because you are dependent upon your senses and your mind for information and you do not know what the limitation of your sense or your mind is. None of us have looked at the world without the mind. And therefore, we are limited by our mind. The moment we start tackling the limitations of our mind is when we know what is truth. And that is where science will start looking like spirituality. Can I have the next slide, please? I'm going to show, I'll come back to this quote. The first thing is, the external is matter, is Amma's quote. The external is matter and internal is consciousness. That is what we all observe, right? Inside we are conscious beings and external is matter, this universe. Second line is, what is the second line? Can somebody read it? Without consciousness, matter remains unknown. Okay, we'll stop there. 
What does that mean? The third line, I'm not even going to read it now because science has not yet come to that. Second line is what I'm going to talk about. Without consciousness, matter remains unknown. What Amma is saying, what modern physics is saying is the same thing. What is known as matter, what is known as reality is actually dependent on your perception of it. Is there really an objective world independent of your perception? Modern physics says no. Modern physics says no. And I will show you that. What is the meaning of that? You see, what it means is this. What is science? We study external objects, right? We study external objects. I, I drop a ball here and it, it, I measure the acceleration due to gravity and it comes to 9.8 meters per second square. Good. Then I go to Japan, I drop the ball, it's 9.8 meters per second square. I go to Cochin, I drop it, it's 9.8 meters per second square. Then my friend Praveen goes to Calcutta and drops it, it's 9.8 meters per second square. You go and drop it in Hyderabad, it's 9.8 meters per second square. Independent of the observation, independent of the place, it comes. It is repeatable experiment, that's why we call it science. But the problem is with that is, it doesn't take into account the fact that all these scientists, the entire structure is still using the human mind. It doesn't take that into account. We have never experimented on the world without going beyond the limitations of our mind. Are there people who have done that? Yes. Yes. Is their perception of reality different from ours? Yes. May I have the next slide, please? I am going to show you three spiritual scientists. Okay? Who is the first person on the left? <laughs> Swami Vivekananda. Who was his guru? <laughs> Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna. I am going to take only one minute. I won't go in depth, okay? You can do a PhD thesis and a lifetime of study on each one of them. I am not going to that. Okay? Sri Ramakrishna used to experience states beyond the mind. And Swami Vivekananda, what is Swami Vivekananda's uh, childhood name? Narendranath. As a, Nare, as a boy, he was very curious to know, is there God? What do you mean by reality? Then his English professor told him, there is some strange person here in Dakshineshwar, they call him a mad man, mad fellow, but he's supposed to be experiencing states beyond the mind, why don't you go and test it out? At that time, Narain went and met Sri Ramakrishna. The rest is history, I won't go there. But you know what? Sri Ramakrishna, Narain used to test Sri Ramakrishna. He used to test his experiences. He even took a course in neurology and anatomy to check if his guru's experiences are real or some nervous breakdown. He was a spiritual scientist. He tested it. He used to test it. And he came back with the same results that just as if I drop a ball and I get 9.8 and if you drop a ball, you get 9.8 and therefore we say acceleration is 9.8. Just like that, there are certain truths beyond the mind that can be tested. Reproducible, testable, repeatable experiments. The only difference is the experiment is done within oneself. Anyway, that was a spiritual scientist. The second one in the middle, who is he? Shankara, who formed the entire philosophy of consciousness and Advaita, which we are going to talk about. Who is the third person? I don't think anybody knows. Oh, I am, wow, okay, it's Ramana Maharshi. Ramana Maharshi was a boy, young boy, Venkat Raman, and he, when he was in his missions, he was studying in high school near Madurai around 1896. He had a terrific fear of death. He laid himself down and felt, okay, I am dying. And therefore, they are now going to take this body and burn it in the funeral pyre. But I still feel I, 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 as firmly as before. Therefore, I am not this body. There is something more to this than this body. And he got up. He got up from that experience, a realized soul, and then went on to become the great Ramana Maharshi. Can we, one more click? And I'm going to show you three scientists who started saying things, almost the same thing as these scientists said. Who was this? Those three are spiritual scientists. These three are our physics scientists. Who's the first person? Who's the second person? Second person. Second person is Niels Bohr. And the third person? Schrodinger, okay? So these, what did this, what it did these three people say that seems so similar to what Vivekananda and Amma and Shankara are saying? That is what I'm going to talk to you about, okay? So let's start. In next five minutes, I'll just tell you an experiment. I'll completely confuse all of you, but then I, my task is done. 
because I have come here only to confuse you. Because I have come here to challenge your perception of reality. I have come here to tell you that what you think is real is not real. So I'll do that. Okay. Next slide, please. It all started with light, okay? With something called a double slit experiment. Now, how many of you have thrown a stone on a lake and made it bounce? Excellent. Yeah, you should. Those who have not, you should try it. It's not worth living without it, okay? You should take a stone and make it bounce on the lake. Okay, very good. Now, when I throw a stone into the lake, what do I see? I see waves, okay? I see ripples. Very good. Now I take a second stone and throw it into the lake. What would I see? I see another set of ripples, right? The first set of ripples will talk to the second set of ripples. Wherever the top of one wave meets the top of the other wave, I'll get twice in this direction. Okay? Yes or no? Yeah. Wherever the bottom of one wave meets the bottom of the other wave, I'll get twice in the opposite direction. Yes or no? Wherever the top of one meets the bottom of the other, it'll cancel. Yes or no? What is this called? This is called interference. Okay, this is called interference. So when I send, so this is what happens. What happened is they started with the light. No, no, the previous slide, please. Exactly. What they did is, they sent, first they sent a light beam through a slit. They sent a light beam through a slit and they got an illumination on the other side. Light went through the slit and it got. Second slide, please. Now, they opened two slits. When they open two slits, they'll get an interference pattern alternating dark and bright, dark and bright, dark and bright, wherever is the top wave, because what happens is light goes through two slits, they interfere with each other and form the band. Just like the two waves from the two stones. You throw two stones in the swimming pool and just like that, these two waves talk to each other. Light goes through two slits, the light through this slit talks to the light through that slit and forms an interference pattern, you get this. So therefore, light is a wave. Everybody knows light is an electromagnetic wave. Light can be in two places at the same time, which is exactly why you are seeing me, and you are seeing me, and you are seeing me. Okay? The light wave is spreading. Fantastic. Everybody knows this. But the problem is, and now listen, they tried the same experiment with electrons. Electron is a particle, no? So electron is a particle, just like this pen. Can this pen be in two places at the same time? No? No? How many of you say no? That's all. The pen can be in two places at the same time. Say no. no. You're wrong. Okay, I'll tell you. What happened is, they tried the same thing with electrons. So they had, go back to the previous slide please, Saram. They sent an electron beam through one slit and they got on a TV screen, they got an illumination and there was an illumined point. Yes, electron is a particle, it's going through the hole and doing that. Just like, for example, if I take this window and I throw a stone, the stone will go and fall on the other side. Perfectly fine. Then what they did was, next slide please, then what they did was, they opened two slits. The moment they opened two slits and they sent the electron beam through that, the scientists were horrified to find an interference pattern. The electrons were behaving like waves. The electrons were going through both these slits and interfering with each other, behaving like waves. They said, how can a particle behave like a wave? A wave is supposed to be in two places at the same time. A particle is supposed to be in one place at one time. What the hell do you mean by an air? No, 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 no. Something is wrong in this experiment. Something is wrong. And so, you know what they did? They said, we'll do one thing. We will try using only one electron. Okay? They said, we will try using only one electron. Let's go back to the previous again. Okay? So they tried using one electron. They sent one electron through the slit and they found an illumination. Next. Then they used one electron through the slit. No, no, no. The, yeah. They sent one electron through both the slits and again they found a wave. What it means is the same electron is going through both the slits simultaneously, interfering with itself and creating a wave pattern. That is crazy. How can an electron go through two slits at the same time? It's like saying that I walked into this hall through this door and that door at the same time. How is it possible that I can walk through this window and that window at the same time? A particle is not supposed to be in two places at the same time. But yet, that's exactly what the electron does. The electron behaves perfectly like a wave and when you put two slits, it behaves like a wave. It goes through both the slits simultaneously, interferes with itself. 
So that was the first big confusion for the physicists. Many people gave up physics at this point. I'm not joking. Even Einstein could not accept the double state experiment. Even Einstein. So I am talking about things that confuse Nobel laureates. So don't expect to understand it. It's okay. Einstein and Bohr used to debate on these things. You can look up the Bohr-Einstein debates. You won't understand a word, but it's fantastic. Okay? I won't understand. The morning Bohr, anyway, we'll talk about that. So what happened is, so same thing. Put an electron through two slits, it behaves like a wave. You take an electron through one slit, it behaves like a particle. So that itself confused people about their idea of reality. What do you mean by matter? What do you mean by particle here? So they started saying lambda equal to h over mv. All of you have learned this de Broglie equation. So matter behaves like waves, waves behaves like particle, which means I have a wave function, which means I am not only here. There is a finite probability I am there. Just like in electron orbitals now are probability waves. The electron orbit is where it's most probably found. We don't know where it is. Like that, I have a wave function too. It's just that my mass is so huge that my wave function is so small compared to Planck's constant. Lambda is h over mv. M is huge. I'm 65 kilos. See, fat fellow. And the electron is damn small. But when you take at subatomic level, the idea of a particle being in one place is not true. Not true. Even we, even I have a function, even I have a probability function that there is a finite probability that I am there right now. And there. And on the moon. And so are you. It so happens that all of us are actually wave functions kind of coagulated at our particular points. We are already connected at a physical level. I'm not even talking about a spiritual level yet. Even at a physical level, there is one energy field everywhere. Science is already beginning to look Vedantic. But that's not the end of the story. That's not the main mystery of quantum mechanics. The main mystery of quantum mechanics comes now. What happens is, can you please go to the slide again? Yeah. What happens is, the next slide, exactly. The problem is, Feynman asked this question. When you open one slit, it behaves like a particle. Yes or no? Yes or no? When it opens one slit, it behaves like a particle. When it opens two slits, it behaves like a wave. But Feynman asked this question. This is the most important question in quantum mechanics, and that is what is affecting all of you. The most important question, unsolved mystery is, Feynman asked this question. When it goes through one slit, it behaves like a wave. When it goes through two, I mean, one slit behaves like a particle. When it goes through two slits, it behaves like a wave. Feynman asks, how the hell did the electron know that you opened the other slit? That's the question. <laughs> ah, the implication of that question is terrible. First, you open one slit, it went and made a pig. You open two slits, it can continue to do the same thing. Why should it change itself to suit you? The moment you open the second slit, it says, Oh, Bala has opened the second slit. I'm supposed to be a wave. Okay, let me wave around. Then I close this. Oh, I'm supposed to be a particle. Let me be a particle. So the physicist said, this is crazy. What do you mean by saying the electron is responding to me? It's not supposed to respond to me. It's an independent thing, independent of me. Science can't keep responding to the scientists. It's not that if Newton tests gravity is one value, if Einstein tests another value, what is your name? What's your name? Huh? And if Puja tests another value, that's a big problem. Science is supposed to be objective. It's supposed to be independent of the observer. Unfortunately, it is not. Modern science is saying it is not. It is not independent of the observer. So what they did was they said, this is total nonsense. How can an electron know what you're doing? So let's do one thing. We'll open two slits. And then we'll put a particle detector and see where exactly this electron is doing. So that's what they did. They opened two slits. So they opened one slit, it was a particle. They opened two slits, it was a wave. So they said, let's keep two slits open and put a particle detector to find where exactly the electron is going. They put a particle detector and kept both the slits open. Now what should happen if both the slits are open? Particle or a wave? Wave. So one slit is particle, two slits is wave. They open two slits, it should be a wave. They put a particle detector. The moment they put a particle detector, the electron goes back and behaves like a particle. Yes. One slit, wave. Two slits, part one slit, particle. Two slits, wave. You open two slits and just put a particle detector. Just look at it. It'll change itself and become a particle. 
it's like the electron is not a particle it's not a wave it's whatever you want it to be the observer is affecting the experiment can i go to the next slide please is the observer affecting the experiment and that is where the whole problem arises that is where science and spirituality merge and i will tell you why what happens is they said many there was a physicist called paul aaron fest he was so confused with his own findings that he committed suicide i am telling you serious things because these things were challenging their idea of reality this what is this word einstein got confused about this what do you mean by saying the electron is the electron is a particle only if i am looking at it the electron is a wave i am not looking at it what do you mean by that he said that do you mean to say the moon exists only when you look at it there is a big discussion on that but anyway so what happens is when they send both slits it's a, when you put a particle detector it becomes a particle again and they did all sorts of experiments i will show you crazy experiments every time it's the same story when you set it up to behave as a particle it will behave as a particle when you set it up to behave as a wave it will behave as a wave so what they did was they said no 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 let's do one thing so this one shows the illusion of so they said i'm not going too much deeper into it there's something called delayed choice where the electron goes backward through time and adjusts itself to your observation i'm not going through that now i'll come to that later if we have time but basically the observer is affecting the experiment that means that means if it is true that the observer is affecting the experiment i no longer know if g is 9.8 because it is 9.8 or because i am observing it i no longer know what is this pen what is the color of this pen what is the color of this pen i no longer know that i am seeing it as black because it is black or because i am seeing it it is black i don't know how do i separate the observer and the observed if the observer is affecting the experiment then modern physics is completely against what we assume science is science assumes that there is a world outside independent of us which we are analyzing that assumption my dear friends is wrong the very idea of this world outside the way you think it is is wrong it is conditioned by your mind an observer is affecting the experiment so now the question is the question now now i'll go into some nice gymnastics you see for the particle so when you open the one one particle one slit it's a particle two slit it's a wave two slits and you put a particle detector it's again a particle so the observer is affecting the particle okay very good what it means is for the electron the particle detector is the observer okay the particle detector is uh, the observation the particle detector is observer it is affecting the electron very good but which means if the observer is affecting the experiment my observing the particle detector is observing uh, affecting the particle detector is or no i am using an instrument which is observing something else the act of observation is affecting it that means the instrument i am observing it so that will be affected too yes or no so that means for the electron the particle detector is the observer for the particle detector some other detector is the observer for that detector my hand is the observer for my hands my eye is the observer for my eye my mind is the observer yes or no and wait 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 i am not finished for my mind i am the observer what do you mean by i what is i for my mind i am the observer for me who is the observer who knows the knower how can the knower be known this is a statement not in quantum mechanics this is a statement asked by yagnyavakya in 5000 year old upanishad called bharararanyaka upanishad it's a quantum mechanics question who knows the knower who do you mean by observer who am i that's where science touches spirituality what do you mean by i okay okay we have pooja here what is your name sir huh ustad here and your name is praveen what's your name huh I can't hear you. Pragya. Pragya. Wow, that's a very nice name, Pragya. Okay, okay. Now we see. I have Bala. So we are asking this question: Who am I? Thirty years ago, okay, 
not 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Oh my God, I'm growing old. Yeah. 40, 40 years ago, I was only this small. You come and ask me, who am I? I'll say, who are you? I'll say, I am Bala. Now I am this big. You ask me, who are you? I don't say, I am Bala plus three feet. I don't say that. My body has changed. Pooja, how old are you, Pooja? I shouldn't ask a girl their age, but let's assume you are 15, okay? okay. Let's assume. No, it's too, that's too big a number. You want a lower number? You're 20. You don't look 20. Okay, just like I don't look 50, right? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> I just told you, right, this is, not the, this is not me. How does it matter what this looks like? So anyway, so Pooja is 20 years old. 18 years ago, she was just this small. They ask you, who are you? She says, I am Pooja. Now you say, you, she doesn't say, I am Pooja plus two feet, right? Ustad doesn't say, I am Ustad plus three feet. Praveen doesn't say, I don't say, I am Bala plus three feet in all directions, by the way. Okay, I, I don't say that. My body is completely changed. Can all of you do one thing? Can all of you rub your hands vigorously? Vigorously. Quick, now, fast, 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 fast. Stop. Ha, stop. Yes. Now I have something news for you. My God. All of you lost around 1 million skin cells right now, when you did this. Okay, you all lost 1 million skin cells. What is your name? The girl in green. Yeah. Huh? Kirtana. So, two minutes ago, if I ask Kirtana, who are you? She says, I am Kirtana. Now I ask you, she doesn't say, I am Kirtana minus 1 million skin cells. The body has changed completely, but the eye is a, eye is a, hold on to that guys. It's an extremely important statement. Second point. Yesterday or this morning, you thought, oh wow, some Bala sir is going to give some fascinating talk and you're very happy. Now you're thinking, when will this fellow shut up and I need to go for lunch? So, half an hour ago, you are very happy. Now you are just fed up. Half an hour ago, I ask you who you are. You'll say, I am Kirtana, I am Mustard, I am Bala, I am Amit, I am Praveen, I am Pooja. Now you don't say, I am Pooja, my inner happiness, plus the sorrow, and you don't say that. Your feelings have changed. Your mind has changed. But the I is a? I is a? I want to hear that mantra. The I is a? Do you know what you just said? Do you know the, the depth of what you just said? Okay. Ten years ago, you did not know physics and science and all that. You did not know Newton's laws. Now you know Newton's laws and all that. Yes, that. Ten years ago, you didn't know Newton's laws. Now you know Newton's laws, right? Yes, good. Ten years ago, I asked Siddharth, who he is? He says, I am Siddharth. Now he will not say, I am Siddharth plus knowledge of Newton's second law. He doesn't say that. The intellect has changed. But the eye is a... The body has changed, the mind has changed, the intellect has changed, but the I, who is this I? What is this I? What do you mean by I? Don't say I am Kirtana, I am Puja. What do you mean by Puja? Is your hand Puja? Is your head Puja? Is your leg Puja? What is Puja? Is the thought Puja? Is the idea Puja? What is Puja? What is I? What is I? What is I? So, the question, the quantum mechanical question of who is the observer has now become who am I? And who am I is a Vedantic question. That's a question that is a subject of spirituality. That is a subject of Vedanta. And that is exactly where science walks into spirituality. That's exactly where quantum mechanics walks into Vedanta. Never forget, did I use the word God till now? Exactly. Did I use any word of any religion till now? I am talking pure physics. And Vedanta is pure physics. Okay? Even the Gita, the Upanishads, or Sanatana Dharma is pure science. Analysis, analysis, analysis. Who are you? Next slide, please. This is the central mystery of quantum mechanics. That is my favorite friend, Richard Feynman. He says, that's the central mystery of quantum mechanics. What do you, how does the observer affect the experiment? Next slide, please. We won't do this, okay? That's very difficult to understand. EPR paradox, 
is Einstein used to, we won't do that because I don't have the time for that, but we won't do that. We'll stick to the question, who am I? So who am I by I, what is meant is pure consciousness. You see, the I, okay, what is the difference between you and me? I'm finished in five minutes. What is the difference between you and me? Meera is sitting there. What's the difference between you and me? The body is different. Okay, Pooja, Meera, all these. Such a young and pretty girl, the body is different. I am this old, balding fellow. Okay, yeah. The mind is different. You're all brilliant young students. I'm just an old fellow blabbering something because I don't have anything else to do. The mind is different. The body is different. The intellect is different, right? So I am boy. I am girl. I am a scientist. I know Newton's laws. I don't know Newton's laws. I am happy. I am sad. I am rich. I am poor. I am big. I am small. I am tall. I am dark. I am Hindu. I am Muslim. I am black. I am white. I am red. I am multicolored. I am a rainbow. All these are differences in the body, mind, and intellect. Difference between you and I are in the body, in the mind, and in the intellect. Can there be a difference in pure I? I am full stop. Is there any difference? I am boy, I am properties are different in pure consciousness, in I, I, I. Can there be a difference? Can there be a difference? Yes or no? No. There is no essential difference between the I in this body and the I in that. Amma says, it is like one sun reflected in ten pots. I have ten pots of water. I have one sun, I have ten reflections. Are there ten suns? No, there is only one sun. There are ten reflections. One pot is blue, one pot is green, one pot is red, one pot is yellow, one pot is golden. So, the reflections look different. What is your name, sir? Huh? Rishabh. Exactly. The reflections look different. The pots are different. This pot is a boy, this pot is a girl, this pot is blue, black. The pots are different. Can there be a reflection, difference in the reflection per se? No. Like that, the eye there, Reflected through that equipment of body, mind, and intellect is called Rishabh. The I there is called Meera. The I there is called Puja. The I there is Praveen. The I there is Dr. Jyoti. The I there is Sumit. I here is Bal. The reflections are different, but it is the same I in all beings. Aham Atma Guda Kesha Sarva Bhuta Sayastita. Krishna Arjuna asks Krishna in the 10th chapter. By the 10th chapter comes. Arjuna knows this Krishna is not an ordinary fellow. He is talking terrific philosophy to me. So he asks, Arjuna, Arjuna asks Krishna, Krishna, who are you? And Krishna answers. Krishna doesn't say, I am God, I am an avatar, nothing. His answer is very important because we want to know God's definition of himself, isn't it? We all say, God is like this, God is like that. Let us see what God has to say. Krishna's definition of himself in the Gita. When Arjuna asks, who are you? Krishna says, Aham Atma Guda Kesha Sarva Bhuta Sayastita. I am the I in all beings. Finished. That is the definition. That is the Sanatana Dharma Vedantic definition of God. The I. The basic I in all beings. Let me ask you another question. And then, you know, there was a king called Janaka. Very rich king. What is his father? His daughter is very famous. Who is Janaka's daughter? Sita. Sita's father, Janaka, was a great soul. One day he dreamt that he was a beggar. He dreamt that he was a beggar and he didn't have food to eat. And he was starving and suffering and begging and wondering when I will get the next food. Suddenly somebody woke him up and he woke up and found that he was in the palatial bed, on a rich bed and he was a king. Okay? Surrounded by, you know, all Sarasongi, uh, Saga, uh, uh, and Parata and all those things. Very good. So he didn't have to be hungry anymore. So he, he goes to the court. He calls his ministers and asks them this question. He says, last night I dreamt that I was a beggar. Okay? Last night I dreamt that I was a beggar and I wake up and find that I am a king. I have a question for you. Am I the king? Listen to me very carefully. Am I the king who dreamt that he was the beggar or am I that beggar currently dreaming that I am a king? That's the question. When you are having a dream, when you are having a dream, the dream looks real to you. Yes or no? Yes or no? This side is asleep. This side is dreaming. So let me ask them. Yes or no? 
when you are having a dream the dream looks real to you point number 1 now comes the most important point point number 2 is it possible for you to have a dream in which you are attending ayut summit and bala sir is talking to you is it possible yes it is possible it is possible of course a nightmare dream also i am coming very sad but yeah it is possible so it is possible is it possible for you to have a dream in which you are sitting in this configuration and listening to me is yes or no it's possible is yes or no yes so first point is when you are having a dream you don't know that you are dreaming second point is it is perfectly possible for you to have a dream in which you are sitting there listening to me therefore there is nothing to say that you are not in a dream right now prove it when you are having a dream it is perfectly real second it's perfectly possible for you to have a dream in which you are sitting here listening to me in this exact configuration therefore how do you know this is not a dream what i mean by that is dreams come and go right is yes or no the dreams come in i'll ask you another question supposing see when i go to sleep i have a dream i get up and find the same world but when i go back to sleep i get a different dream yes therefore i know the dream is unreal and the waking state is real that's what i see yes or no yes or no but the problem is let's assume from your childhood let's assume from day 1 every night when you go back to sleep you get the same dream in that dream you have a different set of parents in that dream you have a different house you are going to a different college you wake up and come to this dream where you have this set of parents and you going to this school then you go back to sleep and there you are getting up in the next day second day 2 of the second of the dream house you are brushing your teeth and going to some other school in that in that school in that dream in this dream you are all progress to your life and you have come to the ayut summit in that dream you are all now in hawaii okay let's assume every night you have the same set of dreams with the same set of people will you be able to say which is real and which is false you won't be able to say continuity doesn't mean reality what is the only thing common in all these dreams i the dreamer is a constant you are the constant who is that i when you understand the self within the self realize man this is india's greatest contribution to the world is a concept of going beyond the mind and understanding the self the scientist does experiments outside the rishi does experiments inside the scientist is a rishi whose experiment is outside the rishi is a scientist whose experiment is inside the scientist laboratory is outside the rishi laboratory is inside he is going so the question is so we all agree this world is affected by the observer so therefore what we see is conditioned by our mind so if i switch off the mind and see then i will know what it is without the mind is yes or no so if i switch off the mind and see the world may look different then i will know the truth okay very good have you ever switched off your mind have any of you switched off your mind yes you do every night you switch off your mind you go to sleep but when you sleep there is no world so the problem is how do i switch off the mind while maintaining awareness see in deep sleep there is no world there is no mind in the waking state there is a mind there is a world so now if i combine the awareness of the waking state with the no mind no thought condition of the deep sleep state if i combine these two if i consciously switch off the mind then i will know what is reality outside yes or no what is conscious switching off of the mind called that is what is called meditation meditation is nothing meditation is a quantum mechanics experiment where you are switching off the mind and seeing what is there and seeing what is reality so this is where it comes the science of consciousness is the connection between spirituality and quantum physics very modern physics the mahatma is one so when you understand it's the same self in all beings when i understand puja when i understand that i am one with you will i exploit you no will i tell lies to you no right when i know that i and you are same will i cheat you no will i try to kill you or take your money no right will i will i send a terrorist to your country no will i have an army to attack your country no is yes or no 
but man has neglected the science of consciousness and therefore we have all the problems that we have today. A Mahatma sees the same self in all beings and there all that a Mahatma can do is hug you with the same love that she will hug herself. That is exactly what you experience in Amma's Darshan. When Amma is hugging you, she is not hugging you as a separate person. She is seeing you. Amma says, I see everything as an extension of the same self. The fact that there is a same self in all beings and you, when you realize this self, you go beyond differences and you go beyond all violence and hatred and you are established in love and this whole world becomes a paradise. That is the only solution to the human's problems. There is no other solution other than spirituality for the human being's problems. Because as long as you think I and you are different, as long as I think I and you are different, I will try to exploit you. But the moment I know I and you are the same, I will stop that. There will be no caste, creed, religion, black, color, gender, no barrier. There will be only love. That is the message of Vedanta. That is the message of spirituality. And that is the message of quantum mechanics. I end my talk here. Namaste. One more thing. If you can go to the next slide. And I'll end with a very, very, very famous quote. <coughs> exactly. No, the previous one. No, the previous one. That is Shankara's explanation of who am I. Mano buddhi chitta ahankari naham. I am not the mind, body, intellect or the ahankara. Nacha krana netre nacha. Mano buddhi ahankari chitta naham. Nacha stotra jikve. I am not this ear or the tongue or this body. Nacha stotra jikve. Nacha krana netre. Not the nose or the eye. I am not these five elements that comprise this world. Chidananda Rupam Shivoham Shivoham. I am consciousness. I am consciousness. I am consciousness. I am the essence of bliss. That is the quantum mechanical and Vedantic result. Understand that. It is that is the source of dharma. That is the source of love. That is India's greatest contribution to this world. That is the science behind realization. At the least, what I want all of you to know is you may not understand all this, but at the least, what you all should have is a sense of awe and amazement when it comes to the wisdom of the ancient Indians. At the least, you should go from this summit with a profound sense of reverence for what India has to offer for Indian spirituality. Don't just say it is bunk. That's all we want from you. Namaste. Bye.